All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's ISTE expert webinar. I'm Marvin Anthony, Manager of Membership and Partnership Strategy here at ISTE. I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. I'd like to point out that the chat button is at the bottom of your screen, and in the chat, you can introduce yourself to other attendees and discuss the webinar. If you have a question for a presenter or a technical question, please feel free to share it uh, via chat. Just be sure to click address to all panelists and attendees, otherwise it would just be uh, me, Desiree, Ari, and Lauren that would be able to see your comments. I'm gonna be recording today's presentation, which will be shared out afterwards with registrants and on ISTE.org. Please stay until the end to fill out a short survey to let us know what webinar topics you're interested in. Uh, today's presentation is Breaking into the Space, Diverse EdTech Presenters, presented by Desiree Alexander and Ari Flewelling of the ISTE Digital Equity Network. Without further ado, take it away, Desiree and Ari. All right, hello everyone. Depending on where you are in nation, I was about to say good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get this started. The title of our webinar is Breaking into the Space Diverse Ag Tech Presenters. And that's what we're actually talking about today is how to break into the ag tech presenter world, especially for diverse ag tech presenters. And we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. Ari? So hi everyone, I'm Ari Fluelling. You can find me across pretty much every single social media platform as EdTechAri, or you can go ahead and email me directly or visit my website if you have any follow-up questions. And I'm located in Southern California. And hi, I'm Desiree Alexander, uh, AKA Educator Alexander. You can pretty much find me across platforms as Educator Alexander, except for on Twitter, I'm Educator Alex. They wouldn't give me that many letters. So I'm Educator Alex on Twitter, Educator Alexander everywhere else. Um, my website is educatoralexander.com and I am the North Louisiana Director for an Educational Nonprofit and I am the Founder CEO of Educator Alexander Consulting. So I think we're going to just hop straight into our presentation. We do want this to be more of a discussion so please use the chat. We're following the chat. Um, we want to answer questions. We want to have a discussion. We're also going to have a Q&A at the end of this. So just have your questions ready, put them in the chat, or just you can wait till the end as well. But we want this to be more of a discussion. So the first thing that we want to discuss is do I belong imposter syndrome? So the short answer to this question is yes, you belong. And in fact, your voice and your presence is extremely necessary and extremely needed in the field of educational technology and education at large. But of course, imposter syndrome is a real thing. Depending on you know what your background is in education, how long you've been in education, or also too, what conferences look like when you walk through the door, all of these things can make you feel like you're not as qualified as you are, or they can make you feel like, do I really deserve to be here? And it's important to acknowledge those feelings because it's definitely worth, you know, exploring them and thinking about them, but ultimately thinking about your worth and the value that you bring into a room. Exactly. I'm going to piggyback on that. And, um, one of the biggest questions I think with imposter syndrome is why me? why did they ask me to do this or no one wants to hear from me um I, i'm not an expert in that you know all those kinds of um really mental and spiritual feelings that we have about ourselves just thinking that our voice is not valued that our um just just and it's not getting down on yourself like you know that you're awesome but why me right no one really wants to hear that from me they're much rather hear it from someone else and that imposter syndrome is heavy is one of those things that can actually stop you from doing things and going after um presentations and speaking engagements and things like that and that's one of the things that um when when ari and i were discussing what we want to talk about today. I love that she said, you know what, we need to put imposter syndrome first because you have to get over that first. And I loved that. And I was like, yeah, that's it's so true. It's one of those things that you're going to fight throughout your career, quite honestly. It's never going to be like, I'm over it. Um, 
I already shaking her head. I know I, I fight it constantly, right? You're constantly like, well, why me? They don't want to hear from me. Um, and then, of course, other factors play into imposter syndrome as well when others may treat you like why you. Um, especially as a diverse presenter, we have a lot of other issues coming up when we deal with imposter syndrome. Not, it's kind of a multi-layered imposter syndrome that um, we're going to talk about, but is one of those things where you have to find your way to get over it. And a part of finding your way to get over it is having really great people around you, really great people in your PLN that can say, well, sweetie, why not you? You yes. know, why not? We need to hear all voices. And like mm -hmm. we say, there's enough room in the ed tech space for everybody, there really is. And what I usually tell people is, Someone needs to hear from you more than they need to hear from me. So just put that in your head. It's, it's not about, if you're in this for the right reason, it's not that you need to hear me, you need to hear Educator Alexander because I'm awesome, which I am, but it's all about, I want you to really get that information. So if Ari says it in a way that connects with you more than me saying it, great. You know, I just want you to get the information more than it having to come from me. But that's that's having um, confidence in yourself and confidence in your message. And I know something that my PLN has helped me a lot with is this idea, and uh, Christina said it in the chat, is you know I feel like I'm saying stuff that's already been said and why is my perspective better or different to share? And you know, everybody, there's all so many different classroom environments, there's so many different socioeconomic environments and you may be talking about Google Classroom and someone may have already heard about Google Classroom for the billionth time, but your use case, your example is going to be unique to you and something that people can learn from. Maybe they already know the points and clicks, but hearing your story is such an important aspect of ed tech. Uh, and also too, just thinking about when you have those people around you, you know, whether it's having them review a presentation with you or say, sending you a link, like here's a conference you should apply to present at. Those different things really help to build a track record of success, which is something that I look at a lot when I'm starting to feel like an imposter because I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Here are the things that I've done that have gone well. I can continue to move forward and I can continue to add to this list and continue to share stories. I completely agree. And one of the things with the, like, others have already heard it, it's already out there, it's been 10 years, somebody hasn't heard it. I promise you. It's one of those things where I all the time come to me and they're like, that's where I want to get in this space. You know, I'm really good with fill in the blank, with screencastify. I'm really good with Kahoot. But they've already heard about, I'm like, sweetie, somebody's sitting there like, I wish somebody would tell me about Kahoot. That's true. That's <laughs> I true. promise you. It's not like it's not going to fall on deaf ears. And the good thing is when you go to conferences and things like that, it's really cool because the people in the room want to hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That came to the room. Now it's different with mandatory training. It just is, right? Mandatory training, people have to be there. And the thing that you have that you're going to realize as a presenter is if I am in mandatory training there, everyone's heard it what's a different twist I can put on it. But you know what, you've already heard it, then let's have a discussion. I don't need to show you the points and clicks. What are you doing with it? Let's talk about what you're doing with it and what you're doing with it. And let's bring it together and say, oh, this is a new way we can use it. So there's mm -hmm. always things you can do with it. Never, and that's part of the imposter syndrome is thinking everyone's already heard everything that I have to say. And I promise you they have not. Mm -hmm. So we are going to keep on trucking and please use this. Repeating ideas is definitely okay, uh, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to keep on going. So now we're going to talk about as a diverse presenter, how do I break into the ag tech space? So in my school district, and I forgot to mention, I'm a staff development specialist for technology integration in a K-12 school district. So it is my job to train teachers on how to use educational technology for the betterment of student engagement and student achievement. And one of the programs we have in our district is we have technology mentors. So it's a train the trainer model essentially, and each school has at least one. 
And that's a great way to get started in the space because you're getting started within your own environment. So if your school district or your county office has some sort of train the trainer program, that's gonna be a great network, not only because you're going to be getting training on how to work with adults, because working with adults is a slightly different animal than working with kids. Um, you'll also get that PLN from other people that are around you in these train the trainer networks. And it's nice because since it's it's in your district or it's in your county, it's a good safety net because you know, you know the environment that you're working in. So you know, you know, student demographics and things like that, because that's always useful to know when you're working with adults as a good starting point. I would completely agree with that. And even getting started in your own school, like if, mm -hmm. if, the, if you're not on the district's wait, radar yet, because I know some districts are huge. So if you're not on the district radar yet, starting at your school, you know, asking your principal, asking your dean, asking your instructional specialist, hey, what can I do? How, what can I present to my staff? I went and I learned this awesome thing. I'm doing this awesome thing in my classroom. How can I present it to the staff? Give me that. So even starting there, you're starting at the right place. You're starting to kind of build your presenter chops. You're starting to learn yourself as a presenter. I think that's a really strong thing to do is to learn yourself as a presenter and learn what you need to work on, learn your pet peeves. Uh, one of the things that I was about midway through my becoming a presenter journey. And I realized I was a on the clock presenter. I was a, I have this to get through, be quiet. I need to get through this. I need to present. I need to give you my knowledge. Be quiet. Like that's, I was just, I was an on the clock. This is my agenda presenter. And I realized not everyone learns that way. Not everyone likes that type of presenter. So I had to grow. And that was about halfway through. I mean, I was you know, already booking conferences and still on that type of presenter. And I had to realize, okay, it's really not about what I'm presenting, it's more about the audience I'm presenting to. But I had to learn that. Um, and the only way I learned that is by presenting. You know, I wasn't gonna learn that by just, you know, not presenting, you have to actually get into it for um, for you to learn that and learn more about yourself and become a better presenter. But definitely, I think getting started in your school, in your district, with your people can help. Um, I think one of the things that um, Ken Shelton, he may not even remember he ever said this at a, an event in New Orleans, um, he said, you are, and I may get the, the mileage wrong, but you're only an expert 3,000 miles away from home. And yeah. I felt that because sometimes in some of the districts I worked in, I asked for opportunities and who are you, right? Who are you to ask for that? So I had to break out and I had to go to smaller conferences in my state and smaller com conferences in my area to build my chop. So that's another thing. If you're sitting there kind of deflated, like I've asked and nobody's giving me that opportunity, break out, break mm -hmm. out, go to, go to a Saturday conference if you can't miss school. Like start looking for these opportunities that where well, you can go and do a, a small present. You don't have to present the whole day. Go and do a small presentation. Do that one. Get it under your belt. Hook up with another presenter. Contact our contact. Hey, can we do a culprit? You know, start hooking up with people. Let's do it together. I'm scared to be up there by myself. But that's how you start to you you start you get started by starting. Yeah, and you bring up such a good point about if you can't get started in your own area or in your own school site because that's what happened to me. I you know, through one circumstance or another, it just didn't work out when I was in the classroom and I just started looking up opportunities to go learn. So anything that would give me a free registration for presenting, I was like, if it's driving distance away, I'm there. So anything that you can do to, to get yourself out there, whether it's a one hour presentation, a 30 minute poster session, all of those opportunities are good. And then when you start branching out to those other conferences, if you continue to do them, that can help you get noticed by whoever's running the conference. And that's what happened to me. I was doing a lot of free conferences for a particular group. And then one day out of the blue, someone I connected with at a happy hour, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, sent me an email and said, hey, like, you know, we'd love to bring you on as a paid presenter. And that was my first gig. And, you know, even then it was something I never necessarily thought about doing, but now, thinking about, you know, making sure there are diverse presenters in the space, that's really important. And the reason why I mentioned the happy hour is sometimes when you go present at these events, there is some sort of like 
presenter event after the, the actual conference. And I highly recommend if you can attend those events, definitely attend and say hello to the event organizer and say, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed being here. You know, I'd love to, to work with you again. And making those interpersonal connections are really helpful with moving beyond just the getting started. And we are going to move beyond just the getting started. <laughs> um, and while we're doing that, I do want to bring up something that Christina mentioned, and that's if you are an, in, if you are an introvert, sometimes it's hard to do going to these after, like you're like, hey, I'm just here to work. <laughs> it's hard to go to these after events and smooth because that's really not your personality sometimes, but it is important to just show your face to, um, you're welcome to show your face to, um, to just get in there a little bit. Don't be fake. We're in no way telling you to be fake because when I'm, I'm done, I'm leaving. Um, like, mm -hmm. You're offended by that, but I'm leaving. But you do want to, you have to, you have to break yourself a little bit and go out and put your face out there because those are the people sometimes who are going to get jobs over you because they're making personal connections. Right. Right. And, uh, for, and you can go for going further. Perfect. And for all of, you know, my, my introverted friends, I'm much more on the extroverted side. If you know me, you, you definitely wouldn't dispute that. Um, but find your extroverted friend and connect with them and be like, let's go to this conference together because then like you've got a wing person now and that person can help introduce you to people. And if you know a more experienced presenter, like seriously, if any of you are in Southern California and you're going to an event, like let's chat because I'll be your wing person. Be like, did you know that so-and-so is doing great presentations about NGSS? I'd love for you to, I'd love to introduce you to them. And then that way that can help break down some of that that barrier. Um, so wing people are great. And also too, when you are getting started with, you know, going further and presenting outside of your district, if you have someone there co-presenting with you, it helps to lower the anxiety level. And even like, I know for me, like in some of the work that I do, especially if I'm speaking to a mixed grade level audience, since my background is mostly with uh, seventh and up, I always am like, hey, coworker, you used to teach third grade. Can you come with me so that way we can make sure we're speaking to all the audiences and it works out really well. Agree. And when we're talking about going further, um, some people contact me when they want to get into the consulting game and that's not what this is. This is mainly about presenting. And they'll say, you know, what should I start charging? I'm, you know, I was told you don't get anything for free. And that's just not where you're going to start. When you start, you're going to be doing a lot of things for free. Um, mm -hmm. You, and you look at it as it's not really for free. You're getting your name out there. Um, you, you're having people, like someone said in the um, in the chat box, if you're spreading a message, hear it, and you're sharing your passion, they're going to start hopping on board. And that's what you want. I mean, it was Rebecca. That's what you want. You want to start sharing your passion and start small. You know how they say think think big, start small. When I started, I had one presentation that I would do everywhere <laughs> and that, that, that was my 50 plus tech twos that was my baby everywhere don't ask me to do anything else 50 plus tech twos is what i do and that's just where i was and then i slowly started adding but i had to be comfortable first i had to be comfortable in myself to do that so just remember that when you're uh, going further is that you're you are going to do stuff for free your main purpose at the beginning is getting your name out there, making sure people know your passion, making sure people know what you do. But I also want to say when you're going further is you want to be careful about getting pigeonholed. You don't want to be the Google girl or the Microsoft girl or the like, stop it. There's too many tech tools out there. There's too many um, um, topics about ed tech. For you to be pigeonholed into one thing so be very careful with that and i think to build on that one thing that i you know first off too like i presented for at least a year for free nonstop, um to get my name out there and to to do that and i did the same thing i had the same presentations and each time they got better because i'd learned from them and as the presentations got better i got better and it all flowed but i think too now being like seven years into doing this, which is wild to me. Um, I'm going back and to your point, you know, making sure I revise those presentations that I, so I'm not just that one thing. 
And I think specifically being a woman of color, trying to revise my presentations to really reflect that viewpoint and reflect where I'm coming from. So while I may have a presentation that focuses on using Screencastify, that's not the title of the presentation anymore. Now the title is something more to the effect of empowering diverse student voices through technology. And then in the description, we talk about, you know, one of the tools you'll learn about is Screencastify because not only, you know, are you getting a diverse presenter when you get to, you know, bring me to an event, but also to through the ed tech, we're touching on the ISTE standards and we're touching on diversity and equity. And I think that's something that people of diverse backgrounds can, can do really well. And I think that that's the perspective that's extremely needed. And piggybacking on that and going to promoting yourself. So as a diverse ed tech presenter, as a woman of color myself, um, there are going to be some roadblocks. You know, if we're going to make this webinar completely honest, um, there, there are going to be roadblocks. We know that prejudice exists. We know that racism exists. And that doesn't go away because we're in the ed tech space. Um, so there's going to be things that you have to question yourself on. Of course, tokenism is a big one. Um, was I hired to be the black chick? Check female, check black. Um, you know, was I hired for that? If I, if I do feel like I was hired for that, what do I do about that? Do I not accept? Do I back out? Do I talk to, it's, it's a lot of questions that I don't know about Ari, but I can't sit here and say, do this and do that because it's hard. It's hard. You have, each situation is different. Each situation, you're going to have a question. Do I speak up about this? How do I feel about this? Um, you know, we have, I know some diverse presenters who will say, they're bigger than quite frankly I am, but they'll say, you know, I'm not going there if I'm the only black person there, you know, on your, on your presenter list. Don't, don't ask me if I'm the only one. Um, you know, do you do that? Do you, it, it's just, it's hard. It's, it's a hard question. It's hard questions to ask yourself, but just understand that as a person of color, as a, a, a woman, as all the things that make us diverse, um, sexual orientation, religion, all the, as a blank, fill in the blank presenter, these are questions that you're going to be confronted with. And it's about thinking, you know, based on your values and your moral system, what are you comfortable with? You know, because sometimes you don't know the presenter list until you show up and then you find out you are the only person of color there. So obviously you're going to present, you're going to do your thing, but how you approach the situation after the fact, you know, that's, that's a conversation you're going to want to have with yourself or with someone from your PLN, or you could reach out to one of us. We'd be more than happy to correspond about that over email. I know, you know, in the past I have seen conferences and I have seen, you know, keynote speaker lists and been a little less than impressed with the selections. Um, but one of the things that that I did is I reached out to that conference and I let them know my feedback in a constructive manner. And now I'm on their conference planning committee. And I think that that's something that if you feel comfortable, you know, promoting not just yourself, but also your views and also the importance of diverse presenters, then definitely, you know, you can use your voice to do that. On a smaller scale, of course, you know, you have the standard promoting yourself things, all the social medias and whatnot, but even something like today doing, you know, volunteering to be a panelist on an ISTE webinar is a great way to promote yourself and promote your cause or, you know, working with um, different like the ISTE blog or your ISTE affiliates blog, things like that are also great as well. Yeah, in, anything you can hop on, like just complete anything. You'd be like, oh, can I do that too? Can I be with you on that? Like anything you can hop on is awesome. Um, anything that you can do to get your name out there in a positive way is good for promoting yourself. Um, so like Ari said, oh, of course, be on any social media you can get on. Um, and we're not even talking about branding yourself. That's a whole different animal, just promoting yourself as a presenter. Uh, but I definitely tell you about branding yourself so just reach out to me I have all kind of resources for that. but just uh, just promoting yourself as a presenter I feel like the number one way that you promote yourself is by presenting mm -hmm. getting like 
you can say, oh, I'm awesome all day long on social media, but what do you have for me? Where can I go see you? What, what are you doing? So I think the, the best way is presenting, not discounting things as presentations. So webinars are presentations. Um, and writing for a blog, getting in your, getting in the magazines for the organization, all of those things is they're, they're presenting your knowledge, they're presenting yourself. Um, and you don't have a place to do a webinar, you've never done one before. Contact me. I just put something on Twitter where I'm looking for ideas for the the fall. I have a, a webinar series that I do, and I've been doing all the presentations. I'm like, I'm sure people are tired of hearing from me. I need to get some other people. So, like, look out for those kind of opportunities where you can just hop on and do one. All of your presentations are not going to be home runs. You're going to fail at some of them. You're going to walk away and go, that sucked. But that's okay. So, but you have to fail. That's how you learn. So, don't be afraid to go out there. Don't be afraid to do a new presentation to put yourself out there because even if it's not the worst, you're still promoting yourself. Somebody in your audience liked it. And quite frankly, I, I hate to say this, but there's so many sucky presenters out there. Even the one that you sucked out there is probably super good. People are like, yes. And you're like, that was horrible. <laughs> so put yourself out there. And I think that's the number one way that you promote yourself. Um, as a new, a new person, in the field as a person of color uh and like a diverse presenter out there like i said there's going to be people that are not going to listen to you as much as they listen to the next person you're going to have to find something in your spirit to be okay with that um or to fight it constantly um mm -hmm. you know i always tell this story of when i was in a school district of the supervisor of technology and i had a really really awesome um, person under me, he was a white male. Um, he wasn't under me, but worked with me. Uh, he was a white male and they would go directly up to him to ask him a question while standing right there. And he would say, well, I don't, she's the supervisor, like ask her. So, you know, I had to learn to kind of let these situations play out and then try to teach a lesson from them. The same thing in the ed tech space. You're going to have people that um, may not like you because fill in the blank. And, you know, it's one of those things where again, it's that hard conversation with yourself. You either have to deal with it or fight, you know, yeah. but don't let it stop you. That's no. my message. Don't let it, you still, you know what? You don't like me. Great. I'm still going to promote myself. <laughs> like mm -hmm. just, just keep promoting yourself. Keep putting it out there, what you do and, and what um, the awesomeness that you do in your ideas and it's going to, it's going to work. Yeah, you know, Mary said it too in the chat, use the unfortunate but real life uh, experiences as teachable moments. And also too, the, somebody said one of their roadblocks is the need for everything to be perfect. If mm -hmm. you wait for something to be perfect in ed tech, you're never going to get started because it happened to me last week. I made slides on like Wednesday, Google changed the interface on Thursday and I got to go re redo my screenshots. So you can't, you can't wait because otherwise you'll never start. But one other kind of small logistical thing about promoting yourself is um, business cards are still a thing. And I highly recommend just making yourself like a little set of presenter business cards. It's definitely, you know, worth doing and direct them to, even if it's just a one page Google site that has just some of your links and some things, just because, you know, when you're having conversation with folks, you know, uh, it's nice to be able to give them some sort of token for them to remember you by. Uh, that's also too why a lot of people have started designing their own stickers that go along with their brand because now their brand is is everywhere on someone's computer not that you have to make stickers but i would definitely at the very least recommend making some business cards for yourself and definitely mary talking about how like your journey of using those those teachable moments it's so important just because a lot of times you're bringing up something that may that someone genuinely may not know or genuinely may not understand based on, you know, their background. And, you know, we don't want to vilify people, but we yeah. also don't want them to continue that sort of behavior. So if you, if you feel comfortable or if you have an ally that helps you feel comfortable with those types of conversations, it's definitely worth it because we're just continuing to educate each other. And going to our last point, just um, from what Ari said about business cards, do not print your own business cards. 
stop it. You are an adult. Go to Vista Print or some kind of place and buy you some business cards. See, don't get me started on branding. All right, so um, <laughs> I, I, get, I get passionate about my branding. But you I can have do a all kinds of stuff to help branding. you guys. Yeah, I do. Y'all let me know. Um, so this is the last line, one sentence, Ari, on if I'm already an influencer, if I'm already a leader in my district, if I'm already there, how can I help? diverse presenters co come into the fold? Reach out, ask people. If you see somebody doing awesome things, ask them to come to your event. If you know, if you see somebody on Twitter and they're putting out awesome things, DM them and ask if they present and bring them to your event. Um, that's huge because you know, sometimes it's difficult for us to to ask or to put ourselves out there. So if you're in a position where you are able to do the asking and able to cut the checks, then ask. And if you don't know who to ask, then reach out and be like, hey, like I'm having this event on math and technology. You know, who are your favorite, you know, math tech presenters? Bonus points if they're, you know, people of diverse backgrounds things like that. And the Twitterverse will come to your aid. So then that way you can reach out to people because sometimes all it takes is somebody getting that first call and that first opportunity to really light their fire and to continue to empower them and boost that confidence. And I, I would honestly say the same thing. I hate to, but reach out, like research, get out of your bubble and research who's out there, who's doing what, um, don't be afraid to hire or bring in those that may not have a super strong following. Mm -hmm. The way that they get a super strong following is by being invited to these type of things. Yeah. So just don't be afraid to reach out and take a, take a chance on people who are really just trying to spread their passion. So that, if, that would be mine. And if you're not in a, a a hiring position for lack of a better term if you're the one being offered events or if you're the one seeking out events you know when you get accepted or when you're you know in negotiations be like hey you know i'd also like to bring x colleague with me or oh you know i'm so sorry i'm not available but here are my five friends that also just so happen to be diverse educators that are available please reach out to them i know they're available for your event and help each other and get going. I know it's something that, you know, for an event, I'm doing a doing an event and uh, they needed a second keynote. And I'm like, here are three people that I know are available and would love to join you at your event too. Uh, so doing those kind of things helps other people get invites, helps other people get into the space. And then it doesn't become something we have to webinar, do have a webinar about. It becomes part of the norm. Agree. And that's um, when I get opportunities you know, I, I do the same thing. I'm like, well, who can I bring along for this? Or who can I tap for this to do it with me? Or I can't do it and I always send that list along. I think that's a perfect, um, perfect ending to the, uh, before we get into question and answers. So do we have any question and answers? Well, not any. Well, answers too. We're not the only ones up here with answers. So any questions? And don't be shy too. Like, you know, both of us have a wealth of experience doing this. And I th think one of the reasons why we brought this webinar topic to ISTE is because when we both got started, there was no roadmap. There wasn't anybody that was doing this. This it wasn't an established way for, you know, any teacher, let alone diverse educators to get out there and share their stories. So we wanted to, to try and help lay the groundwork for the next group of people to not only follow in our footsteps, but succeed. So and thank you, Christine. I forgot I'm doing a um, webinar in December on branding. Completely forgot about that. So thank you for bringing that up, Christine. I need to sit in on that one. I'm sure I could pick up some tips. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, yeah, but I completely forgot that until she put it. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am doing that in December for free. Um, any questions? Lauren asks if you just leave them in the chat. Oh, here you go. Which social platforms do you find the most effective? Um, so to me, Twitter is a little bit like preaching to the choir sometimes. Um, 
Facebook seems to be one that I don't use as much as I should, but it seems like Facebook has a little bit of a broader reach to more people um, just because pretty much everybody's on Facebook at this point. Um, so yeah, I would say Twitter, if I'm trying to get like people that are embedded in the work and get it, and then Facebook, if I'm looking for a new audience or people that may not necessarily know already. And that's the main two um, for me as well. I do Instagram as well. Um, those are my top three, Twitter, Instagram, and, and Facebook. You can do like Periscope, you can do Voxer. There, there's so many out there, but to get the, the biggest bang for your buck, I feel like those are the, the top three. Yeah. Um, another question, do you invite people as panelists to online events? And if so, what's the ideal number? Um, I have, and I think my ideal number is four, um, with me being either four complete or four with me being the um, the moderator. And as a moderator, you can't talk as much, so I have to like shut my mouth for a lot of it, but I kind of like put those things in. But I like a good, I like a good four, especially if you have like an hour. Um, if you don't have a whole hour, it can get tricky, so it depends on the time that you have yeah and you know too even like looking at the the two of us on this webinar it would have been awesome if we could have had a gentleman of color or if we could have had you know someone that identifies as an lgbtq plus uh, educator present on this topic as well because we know they bring a diverse perspective to this issue this this topic unfortunately just the timing didn't work out we were unable to but you know keeping those types of things in mind when you're presenting on topics is also really important to make sure that the panelists you bring are panelists that are going to help represent a diverse perspective of the topic as well as your audience. So, and, and then somebody Seth, said in the chat, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> he, he only did it to all panelists, so please. Oh yeah, so Seth uh, said to the panelists, a user tip when dealing with rejection from conferences, write back, back and ask them for advice as to how to get accepted next time. And also too, if they give you a form letter, push back and ask again and say like, thanks, like I appreciate you letting me know how many sessions and what your acceptance ratio was, but I'm looking for specific feedback on my presentation. I'd really appreciate it. Like, don't be afraid to ask for that. And also don't be afraid to say, like if you're already going to the conference, to say, hey, if someone backs out, keep me on the list as a fill-in. And I've gotten presentations that way before. Where they're like, oh, I remember that girl. She won it. And I'm like, yes, I'm here. I'm already here. Why not? I can go present. Yeah. Yeah, keep, keep those kind of things, kind of like humbling things in mind. Um, so someone said, to go back to something mentioned earlier, I always fear that I'm going to propose a session that people already know about. How do you know um, that you're presenting ed tech that's in demand? I would say a couple of things. One of the things you can do is look at what was presented the year before, like look at the different sessions and you can kind of see what this conference is all about and what may be in demand. Um, anything from your big tech companies are always in demand. So your Google, your Microsoft, your, um, I mean, those are big biggies, but you know, your, your flip grades, Apple, your flip grid, yeah. your Apple, your, like, all, all those kind of things, uh, Wakelet are always going to be in demand. Um, then my, my last thing would say, if I should be, don't worry about what's in demand, do what's true to you. Because even if Kahoot has been around for so long, but there's new features to Kahoot. There's, the, there's people that have never heard of Kahoot. So even if it's something that you're like, oh, it's been around for so long, everybody's using it somebody needs to hear about it so yeah it was and to build on that too what's your spin because maybe you're using kahoot yes. in a personalized learning environment and maybe i'm like oh i never thought about using it that way how does this person do that so if you can you know drill it down and get specific about a use case that's awesome it is also too if you're presenting about ed tech and you can relate it to standards and co of the content i know we're always looking for more math always looking for more NGSS, always looking for more special education. My husband's a special education teacher. And every time he goes to a conference, he's like, I think maybe there are like four or five sessions tailored to me as a special ed teacher. 
So if you've got that specialized experience, throw that in with your EdTech tool as long as it's authentic and actually makes sense. And that's going to help you stand out with the proposed session, even if it is, you know, something that supposedly everybody knows. But I'll say this, we're making the transition from Exchange to Gmail in my district. And there's a lot of things a lot of people don't know. And Gmail has been around a long time. Yes, so you, there's you would always be surprised. things people don't know, guys. And go, piggybacking on what you said about making it specific, even specific to your area. So with um, low income students, using this tool with an all girls school, using this tool, like even if it's just your area and I'm using this, using this tool with one iPad, right? <laughs> I mean, if I, if I was at a school only had one iPad, I'm like, that's what I'm going to, because that's my situation. So even thinking about things like that, like how do I use this tool in different scenarios would work. Yep, 100%. So I, I'm guessing, I don't, I don't see any more uh, questions. But I do thank you for the awesome chat. Like, just thank you guys so much just for the, the comments and the, the amens and the questions and the, I'm, I'm just loving it. Thank you so much for being active because I've done webinars where we're like, anyone, anyone, Bueller? So thank you so much for being active and thank you Ari for presenting this session with me. Of course. Me. Thank you so much. Thank you Marvin and Lauren for letting us do this topic just thank everybody and of course we would not give you our email addresses if we did not expect you to email us so please feel free to follow up reach out if you think of something tonight while cooking dinner let us know we'd love to continue the conversation with you because we know this is such an important topic but also too we understand that it's a personal topic for some people yes. and that you know chatting via the chat box might not be comfortable for you so by all means feel free to reach out. Yeah, connect, we're on, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, connect wherever works best. We're more than happy to, to help you because, you know, uh, this is going to be really nerdy, but uh, I watched the show, The Orville, and the, it's kind of like a riff on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And the leader of the starship says, we all do better when we all do better. And I think when we all do better, it ends up be benefiting our students. So please, you know, don't hesitate. Wow. Thank you so much, Desiree and Ari. Um, I just want to make a few closing remarks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and thank you to our wonderful presenters. Uh, this presentation has been recorded, and the archive link will be shared out via email and on ISTE.org. Uh, this season, live webinar attendees will also receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, the certificate can be found in the follow-up email you'll receive in about 24 hours with the recording of this webinar. So as we wrap up, I'm going to include a link in the chat to a brief survey about today's presentation. There it is. And I encourage you to complete the survey as it provides us with very valuable information about how to continually improve our webinars and also gives us insight on the types of topics you're interested in learning about. So thank you all again, and I hope to see you next week at our next expert webinar, What's Up in AI for K-12 Education, presented by the ISTE Learning Spaces Network. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much.